Hey guys, we have a fantastic show for you today. I am talking with World Series of Poker champion Annie Duke. Annie is also a phenomenal author who has written several books, some on playing poker and others on making decisions, which means all of her books have been on making decisions. Anyway, Annie and I are talking about her latest book, Quit, and this is a rich conversation that well, she goes through uh, an executive level training in this that you are going to want to listen to. It will help you make better decisions uh, at your workplace, in your home, in your relationships. This is just a phenomenal conversation that you're going to want to tune into. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the Original Strength Podcast. Pull up a chair and buckle up. It's the Original Strength Podcast. So, Annie, you're like super famous. Um, <laughs> that, that is an overstatement. But okay. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> world series of poker champion, like, like you were at one time, I think the top female winning person in history. That's true. And you're still in the top, um, which is just neat. Which is fun. I haven't actually played a single hand since two th- sometime in early 2012, I think. That's amazing. So you're just a legend so yeah like you're I, again famous. I don't know about that but okay and you have so many talents like you're also a very accomplished author you've written several books um some on poker some on decision making which I guess means all of them are on decision making they're, they're all on decision making that's <laughs> right yeah um and like so I just read your your I guess quit is your latest book right quit's my latest book it came out in October Awesome. Yeah. Uh, so not really what I expected. Um, oh, which was great. I like, like that. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was almost like a, I don't know. It's like the upside down world for me from like stranger things. Yeah. 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 Um, because like, you know, and like you, you, you talk about in the book, but like, we're all, we're, we're kind of programmed to not be quitters. Um, you know, like you can't be successful if you're going to quit and everything like that. But you totally flipped that upside down on its head. And I thought that was just awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, basically what I'm saying is you can't be successful unless you quit. Yeah. Um, so, and that's not to say, so here, here's, I think the problem that people have in sort of thinking this through is that what is absolutely true is that anything that you have been successful at, you will have stuck to. So that's true in retrospect, right? For me to have been a successful poker player, I had to have stuck to it. For me to have a successful book called Quit, it means that I needed to stick to it and write the whole thing. So that's true. So grit is a really big component of success in the sense that when you're doing something that is worthwhile, It will sometimes be hard. And in order to be successful, you need to stick to it when it's worthwhile, even if it's hard. So that's true, right? Totally agree with that. I think that the work on grit is excellent and and people should read Angela Duckworth's book and it's wonderful. The thing that people miss though, is that in order to be successful, you also must quit things because it's that word worthwhile right? What we want to do is stick to things that are worthwhile, independent of whether they're hard or not. If they're worthwhile, then it's worth it by definition to stick to it. But if it's not worthwhile, then if you stick to it, there's a huge cost associated with it because it means that you can't switch to things that would be worthwhile for you. It means that you're sticking into some, you're sticking with something often just for the sake of sticking with it, um, that isn't actually getting you to where you want to go. It's not actually helping you achieve your goals. And the longer that you stick with something that isn't helping you achieve your goals, the slower your progress toward those goals is going to be. So by having the understanding that under those circumstances, it's correct to quit, that's going to help you be successful because it's going to allow you to switch to things that are going to get you to where you want to go. And when you look at the balance of grit versus quit, it turns out that there's more quitting associated with success than gritting because you sample a whole bunch of things in your life. And it's only a handful of things that you actually end up sticking to. 
The rest of them you should quit. That's kind of the point of sampling, right? So you're mostly quitting. And then when you find something that you stick to, then you're really sticking to it. And that's what the, that's what sort of the secret sauce is. So what I felt was that there's so much conversation around grit and it builds character and we all need to be gritty in order to succeed that someone needed to write a book that was having a conversation with grit and saying, but there's this other side of the puzzle and we need to not lose sight of that because I don't want you to get stuck. So, man, okay. So it's, it's less about having blind grit and having intelligent grit. Yeah. Um, like, and so uh, like you're talking about like the whole time you're saying all these things, I'm like, man, it's like, so it's like the art of quitting. Mm. Yeah. So I, I have a tough question for you then. Okay. How do you know if something's worthwhile that you're right. doing? So this, that's the whole thing. It's, it's hard to know. Mm -hmm. It's hard to know when something is worthwhile because that's a matter of expected value. Uh, what is expected value? It's um, what are my gains or losses over time? That's what you're thinking about, right? So, so this is a forecasting problem. I need to be looking into the future and saying, as I look into the future, do I feel on balance that this is going to on its own? cause me to gain ground toward my goals, or more importantly, in relation to other things that I could do, right? In other words, is this the best thing that I could be doing in comparison to other things that I might be, cho might be choosing? And like all of those decisions, that decision is made under conditions of uncertainty, right? So when we're forecasting things, uh, we don't have all the facts and we, you know, and, and we don't have a time machine. So I can't look ahead and like know for certain, uh, whether it's, you know, going to work out for me or not. There's a lot of luck involved. Um, we all have that feeling of, I wish I knew then what I know now. Right. So, and that's that feeling of, Oh, I discovered new information after I made a decision to do something, discovered this new information. Um, actually that's one of the reasons why quitting is valuable. Cause when you find out that new information and you realize, Oh, I wish I hadn't started this, then you can stop. But so that's the, that's the rub, right. Is that forecasting is hard. You have to be able to sort of look into the future and think about this thing that is is not uh, objectively visible, right? And make a forecast that's going to be probabilistic in nature about how well something is going to work out in the future. So that's really tough. So I acknowledge that. The issue that I have is that the solution to that toughness is to default to grit. In other words, what sort of the idea is, so I've started something. Maybe I'm getting some signals that it's not going well. That could be because it's worthwhile, but hard. It could be that it's worthwhile, not, sorry. It could be that it's not worthwhile and maybe also hard. Okay, but I'm sort of getting some signals that it's not going well. And now I have to make a forecast, right? Is this something that I should walk away from it? Or is this something that I think that if I stick to it, I'm just in a dip. And if I stick to it, then I'm going to be able to actually achieve what I want to achieve. So that's that's the hard question that we have to ask ourselves. And the issue that I have is that the default to that is just stick it out. In fact, I think that we default that to that so much that we tend to stick to things until we know for sure that it won't work out, right? Until it hurts. Beyond that, like, yeah. I mean, if you think about... um you know, like, for example, there's a lot of people who have died on Everest because they kept going until it was a dead certainty that they needed to turn around. And by the time that that's true, first of all, it's too late. And the fact is that there's really no decisions that are going to be particularly high quality where you're making that decision when you're 100 percent certain. So it, that's true on the starting decision, too, like when you when you decide to start a job you're not 100% sure, certain that the job is going to work out. Like, how could you be? Like, you, you've never done the work. Like, you haven't been in the company. You haven't been around your coworkers. None of that stuff. Like, you just don't know, right? Um, so we start things when we're not certain, but then we'll stay in the job until we know that we have no other choice. Either we know we have no other choice or we're 100% certain there's another opportunity available to us. And the thing is that both of those things tend to be too late. So- 
that's where the, that's what I'm trying to do is say, don't default to, I'm going to stick it out until I'm sure, because that's how I'm going to figure out if it's worthwhile. You have to start to think about what are the things that, that the world might be telling me that would tell me that this isn't worthwhile anymore. And let me try to catch those things early enough so that I can make good decisions about whether to stick or not. Right. So if I'm understanding, like, what are the early signals that tell me that the expected value might be going against me, even though I'm not certain, even though if I stick to it, maybe it would work out, but, but the math is just not there, then maybe I can get better at this stick quit decision instead of just defaulting to winners never quit. But sometimes like the world can be shouting at you that stop, like this is not working but you're so emotionally invested or I don't know, I guess it's ego. Um, you, you wrote a beautiful thing about like yeah. quitting, quitting your identity. <laughs> oh, you know, it's, yeah. it's very hard to, to quit yeah. on like your ego, yourself, your, uh, your dream, your like, so how do, how, how do you do that? Yeah. So I think we can, you know, when we think about what stops us from quitting, I think we can divide it into two categories. One would go under cognitive bias, right? And we can talk some about that, but these are these are cognitive errors that we make um, that result in a failure to stop things. So there's a variety of those. Like we can again, we can go into them, but sunk cost fallacy, endowment, omission, commission bias, status quo bias, optimism bias, uh, shore loss aversion is another one. Um, there's a variety of things that make that difficult. So that that's in that category. That's the cognitive side. And then there's this also this other category, which is uh, motivational in nature. Um, so that's coming from sort of the more motivational psychology, behavioral psychology side, as opposed to cognitive psychology side. Um, so, uh, so when we're thinking about the motivational side, um, this gets into uh, things like internal and external validity. So let me explain what those two things are because that helps us with identity. Um, so internal validity is feeling like you yourself are consistent as an individual and that you make good decisions, right? So that's internal to you. Like, how do I sort of view myself over time? How do I view myself as a person? And then there's something called external validity, which is how do I think Tim views me? Right? Does Tim view me as a consistent person, as a reliable narrator, as a good decision maker? So we have those two things working. Um, and I'm sure you've felt that before in your own decision making. Like, what is what are people, how are people going to judge this decision? Oh. And then also that feeling of how myself am I going to judge it? So those are those two pieces. That's where that's where we can really kind of think about identity as those two things coming together as a whole, right? How do I view myself? And how do I think other people are going to view me? So I think that one of the most stunning examples of how identity plays into these kinds of problems actually comes from a company. And that company is Sears. So Sears, um, you know, as you know, retail company sold everything from underwear to wrenches. I think you could get your car fixed there. Like Come see the softer side of Sears. There you go. Yes, that's right. Right. You could get intimates. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, so it started in the late 1800s. The, the reason why it was kind of like the sell everything store was because it started in the late 1800s um, as the book of bargains. Um, and the idea was that there were a lot of people who lived in rural America and mail routes had just opened up. Right. So now all of a sudden mail can get to these people in rural areas that don't really have access to cities. They're not very close to cities. Um, but they wanted things that people had in cities, like bicycles and pots and pans. Um, I think you could buy, uh, at some point, you could buy a car in the Sears Robot catalog, catalog. But, you know, basically anything that was available in a city. So the idea was they were going to get everything. So it was this 500-page book of kind of anything that you could imagine. Um, and it did really well in, uh, I think it was in the 1910s in there, Um the, it IPO'd and it represented like the biggest IPO. I think it was in Goldman Sachs history. Uh, you can fact check me on that. I'm not, I think it was Goldman Sachs. Um, 
I think Sears himself was worth $26 million in like 1920. I mean, it was a huge company. So, uh, so then what happened was that sort of in the twenties, people start having cars and people can drive places. And once people can drive places, um, the catalog business that they, they realize is going to maybe get supplanted, right. By people not buying by catalog, but rather actually going to stores at which point they decided to make a retail play a, a, a physical retail play. Um, and they start opening up stores around the country. So they open those stores up. It works wonders, right? So they've still got the catalog, but now they've got physical stores where people can go get whatever they want. By the 1950s, Sears represents 1% of US GNP. This is a giant store. Um, but then what happened was throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s, you start seeing competition for Sears. So, you know, Sears used to kind of be like the, the place. But now they start to get pushed from the top by places like Nordstrom and uh, Neiman Marcus and Saks. So they're losing that sort of part of the market. Uh, but then on the bargain side, you start to see Walmart, Kmart, eventually Target come in. Um, and so it's getting squeezed in the market. And when it gets squeezed in the market, it starts to financially falter. Um, by the 90s, it's no longer number one. I think it dropped to number three. And then it really starts doing badly. In the 2000s, it merged with Kmart. I think that the at that point, Kmart, which had at some point been number one, also was faltering as Target and Walmart really started to take over. Um, and when Kmart and Sears had this like merger, they called it a double suicide. <laughs> um, and then it goes bankrupt. Okay, so that's kind of like everybody sort of knows that story about Sears. Uh, so what on earth does that have to do with quitting? Well, what it has to do with quitting is that in the 1930s, when they actually created those stores because of cars, that's the reason why they said we're going to have physical locations, um, because they recognized that cars were going to take over the world. Um, they said, you know what people might need for these cars? They might need insurance for the cars. So why don't we sell insurance in Sears stores? And so they founded a company called Allstate Insurance. Okay, so uh, eventually Allstate, which did you know just sell car insurance in the stores, starts selling more insurance products, spins off. I mean, Sears still owns it, but they now become Allstate Insurance. They're not just located in Sears stores, um, and they become the biggest pers personal liability insurance insurer in the in the nation. All right, so Sears owns that. And then uh, they also got into the credit business. So they always had like their Sears credit card, but now they found found um, Discover card in order to provide their uh, customers with credit. So that's okay. That seems to be a good company. Um, they also had Dean Witter, which was a stock brokerage. Um, it's no longer a business because it got bought by Morgan Stanley, uh, but it was a big one. And then also Coldwell Banker, which is the real estate company. Right, so Tim, what you might be asking yourself here is if they owned Allstate, which the last time I checked Allstate's market cap was $40 billion. If they own Dean Witter and Discover, which got acquired by Morgan Stanley, and at the time represented 40% of Morgan Stanley's market cap. Um, and then if they, if they had a Coldwell Banker, how is it that they went broke? That's kind of a head scratcher. These companies are worth a lot of money. And that's where identity comes into play because what happened was that when Sears was faltering in the early 90s, remember they got knocked out of the number one spot and they're now faltering in the early 90s. Um, the board of directors met because the shareholders were demanding action because the stores were not no longer making money. And they said, we want you to do something about it. Um, and what they said, they came out of that and it's written in the meeting notes. They said, we, we need the way we're going to succeed is to get back to our retailing roots. That's what they said. So they made the decision that all of the financial services companies, which all of those were the insurance company, Dean Witter, Discover, Coldwell Banker, all of those financial services companies were a distraction 
to their retailing roots. That's who they are. And they sold off Allstate. They sold off Dean Witter Discover. They sold off Cold War Banker all to try to save the retail business. And then they went broke. Have you ever seen um, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade? I have. With the knight who was guarding the the Holy Grail? Yeah. They chose poorly. Yeah. <laughs> That's quite right. So, you know, so this is this is the issue, right? Is um what happened with Sears was that they said we're a retail company. Mm. Like, let me ask you this, Tim. Did you know that they had such a big financial services empire? So I remember, no, I didn't. But I do remember as a child, them starting the Discover card because I remember my parents getting that card and using it at Sears because on on Friday nights, we would go out to the mall and go to Sears. (laughs) Yeah. uh, So I remember that. It was because they (laughs) also had a pet store uh, inside of the Sears that I went to. Um, They had everything. So here, that's what the issue is, right? So, so this is what we need to think about is that you have a choice. They had a choice. So selling things is quitting them, right? If I sell my car, I'm quitting. I'm quitting my car. Um, so they had a choice about what parts of the business they were going to quit. And from the outside looking in, you're like, well, you have these, this, these retail stores that are losing money. And then you have this financial services empire that you've built. The problem was, and we can go back to that internal and external validity issue. They were found, they viewed themselves as a retail store, as a retail chain. And the that's how the world viewed them. The world didn't think of them as a financial services company. The world thought of them as a place that you go and you buy stuff. And that's why they said we need to get back to our retailing roots. So what's true for Sears is true for every one of us as individuals, is that the hardest thing to quit is who you are. It's really hard to walk away from an identity. And that's true whether it's an identity that's surrounded by like, you know, around like a career or a job or something that you've really sort of stuck your neck out on. Um, It could be a project or a product that you're developing or something like that. Um, So that's really hard. And then the other thing that's really hard is it's really really difficult to quit beliefs that are defining beliefs for you. You know, and as we look out in the world right now and we say, boy, there's a lot of people who have some kooky beliefs and it seems like the evidence is pretty clear that that those beliefs are wrong and scratch your heads as to why they aren't giving those beliefs up. Just understand those are the hardest things to give up. And by the way, you're doing it too. All the time. So am I. So like, I think that's one of the reasons why I love this book so much, because it's, it, it's not just about quitting. It's it like actually gets to your soul a little bit. Um, and, and, and it's so applicable to every area of your life. Like, you know, you're mentioning businesses or, or your jobs and stuff, but relationships or even conversations. I mean, it's, it's very like, this gets deep to me. And I, that's why yeah. I thought it was such a neat, very yeah. neat book. Yeah. I mean. You know, I think I think relationships are one of the really clear examples where we can see the issue with, you know, remember I said before, you know, the problem is that if something isn't worthwhile and you don't quit it, it's going to slow you down because it means that you can't switch to something that is worthwhile that's going to help you to achieve your goals. So I think we have an intuition that quitting like stops our progress. Um, We don't really realize that that quitting gets you to where you want to go faster. And I think relationships are a really good example of that. So like Tim, I mean, what I would ask you is maybe this has happened to you or you have a friend this has happened to where they're in a relationship, they're telling you how how unhappy they are, that, um, you know, they really don't think things are working out. Um, Maybe you felt this for yourself. And, you know, then it's, it's like you see them six months later and they're still in the same relationship and they're still incredibly unhappy and they still say it's not working out. And, you know, the question is, why aren't you leaving there? You know, and well, maybe I can turn it around. I've put so much time into it. You know, I've put my heart and soul into it. And I think maybe I can turn it around. And then you see them six months later and it's the same situation. And six months later, it's the same situation. And it can go on for years, years and years and years like that, where they're not happy. 
And it's not a relationship they want to be in. But because we, because quitting things is so hard for us as human beings and considered to be so, such a negative thing. And because there's always a tomorrow where maybe it might work out. All of a sudden, what you see is that, and sometimes it's actually even just what's called ambiguity aversion, fear of uncertainty. So you'll hear people say, but what if I never find somebody? Right. And it's like, but you, you're you really unhappy in the relationship you're in. Like, why would that be worse if you don't find somebody? What if I find somebody new and I'm not happy in that relationship either? OK, but you're really unhappy in the relationship you're in and maybe you'll find somebody awesome. But they won't switch like they come up with all these reasons. And then all of a sudden it's five years later. And that's five years that they could have been going out and finding their soulmate. But it's five years that they've now spent because of the forces that work against quitting, where they've achieved a a tremendous amount of unhappiness. But for fear of quitting, for whatever the reason is that they're not willing to make the switch, they cost themselves five years of being able to go and find someone who is great. And I think that that's true for kind of everything we do, right? Not just for relationships, right? So you know, I mean, that's I think the tragedy of the the whole thing is that is that getting stuck? Yeah, uh, that's beautiful. Um, I I kind of call that the it's like the ground zero effect, where like when the bomb goes off, if you're in the middle of it, all you see is the smoke and the noise. You can't yes. see anything. You can't hear anything. But everybody else has like a bird's eye view, <laughs> and they can clearly see what you, I mean. They actually do know what you need to do, but you can't. You can't take it in. You can't. You can't see it yourself. And yeah. I think that that's such a good point to make because. What follows from that is that um, if you can see it for other people, they can see it for you. Yes. Right. So, so this is actually, this is actually like, I love that analogy that you gave to ground zero. Um, I might steal it. It's excellent. Um, Which is when we go back to that question that you asked me, which was such a, an insightful question about, but how do you know if something's worthwhile? Well, what you just told me is when you're looking from the outside in at somebody else, you can tell if it's worthwhile for them pretty clearly. It's just that they can't tell, right? right? Because you're looking at them going, this isn't worthwhile Um, or it is worthwhile, right? So I think a lot of the key to figuring out this worthwhile problem, which is the whole game, is to get out of ground zero. So there's, there's a couple of different sort of broad strategies for getting out of ground zero. One is, if if I think Tim can see my situation more clearly than I can, I should talk to Tim. Because he's going to be able to see it better than me. So when I come to Tim with that complaint about, you know, whatever, my relationship isn't going well, or I hate my job, I need to tell Tim, and by the way, Tim, I really want you to be an honest broker here. I don't want you to tell me what you think I want to hear right? Mm -hmm. That everything's going to be okay. And I'm sure you can turn it around. And I understand how hard this is for you and blah, blah, blah. And let, you know, let me hear what I want to hear. I want you to tell me what I actually need to hear because I don't want to be five years down the road. That's the thing I don't want. So if you really think that, let's say it's a relationship. If you really think that it's worth a certain amount of couples therapy and if you really think that there are certain behaviors of mine that I could change that would make things better, If you really think that I can work through this and I should give it more time, tell me that. But don't tell me that because you think it's what I want to hear. Tell me that because it's what you really believe. And if you believe, you know what, I've been listening to you for a long time. I know you've tried a lot of stuff and you have done couples therapy and you've worked to whatever. And honestly, I think this isn't time. You know, this isn't the right relationship with you. I would also like you to tell me that. But I got to tell you that's okay. Because otherwise you're not going to. Because let's admit it, Tim. How many times have you seen someone who really is in a bad relationship and you just, you zip it, man? Well, yeah. Like, well, I was thinking like what you just laid out again was beautiful. But then I was like, man, you're a very mature person wanting to be out of ground zero because most people just want to tell you their problems. And, and then, then they just want to, they're just venting. Yes. So you you have to, so this is a decision that you have to make for yourself. So here's the key. When a friend comes to you and they're complaining, you can say to them, is this like, are you venting? Are you looking for just empathy? Do you want me to tell you what I actually think? And even if they say yes, 
you probably shouldn't believe them, but at least they've given you permission to do it. This isn't about you as the person coaching someone. It's the person who's being coached who has to tell the coach. I have to say, no, tell me the truth. I promise you, I'm not going to stop being your friend. Even if I stay with them, you're going to be my friend. It's going to be totally fine. Like I need to actually know what you think. Like you have to give that permission. So that's like the first broad category. It's like, Okay, one of the ways for me to get out of ground zero is to go ask, talk to somebody. The other way for me to do it is to think about the situation before the bomb hits. So that I can do as well. So this was, I think, one of the great insights in psychology in the 1970s, which was that it came from Barry Staw, who's a psychologist uh, who's done a tremendous amount of work in Uh, this broad phenomenon called escalation of commitment, which is increasing commitment to losing causes uh, is the way that uh, we can think about that. So he had a a big insight in the 70s, which is that as humans, we have the intuition that when we start to get bad news, like when we're getting bad signals from the world that what we're doing might not be working, that we'll stop away, like we'll stop and walk away. So that's the intuition that we have. And what he said was that that intuition is basically bonkers, that actually when we get those signals, when we get that bad news, we increase our commitment to what we're doing. So um, so let me just start with the intuition itself. The intuition seems really obvious, right? Um, Because before I start up a mountain, I would obviously tell you if a snowstorm comes in, I would turn around. If I were running a marathon, I would tell you that if I broke my leg in the middle of it, I wouldn't keep running. Sounds reasonable. Right. And yet we have people like Siobhan O'Keefe in the 2019 marathon who broke her fibula bone on mile eight and finished the race. Totally against medical advice, by the way. Like completely against medical advice. Um, And lest you think that she's unusual, there were three other people who broke something in the same marathon and finished the race. And do a quick Google search and you'll see this happens in every single marathon, right? So, okay, so that's weird, right? Because we all have the intuition that if I broke my leg, I wouldn't keep running. And yet we know that, of course, we keep running. We, you know, people who are who are um, investing in the stock market, they can tell you what their thesis is. They, they can, you know, they, they can say like, well, I have a thesis that Bitcoin is not correlated with inflation. And so it's a really good hedge against inflation. And then they own Bitcoin. It turns out to be correlated with inflation and they don't sell it because they say, well, I can't sell now because I want to get my money back. Or they say, I can't sell now. Now it's really cheap. Even though if you had if you had asked them in advance and you said, what could happen in the world that would make you sell? They would say, well, I mean, I'm buying because it's cor- I don't think it's correlated with inflation. So if it's not correlated with inflation, I guess it would sell. So if you ask them in advance, they'd be able to sort of say what they, they were going to think. But because you haven't asked them in advance, they don't react to the signals that are clearly implied in the action that they've taken. In the same way that, um, you know, like Jeffrey Rubin, who was actually a psychologist who worked on this problem, was climbing a mountain, a big fog rolled in. His climbing partner said, I don't think we should keep going. And turned around and he kept going, even though in advance of that, he would say, I would never climb in a heavy fog. Okay, so so we know that we don't pay very good attention to that stuff. So the way to get out of ground zero when it comes to this and Barry St- some of Barry Starr's work has shown that this actually works quite well. Also, there's a lot of work on like pre-commitment contracts in general and some work from Katie Milkman um, in her lab is, okay, then don't rely on yourself to notice those things when they're occurring on the fly. Instead, write them down in advance. Create a list of kill criteria. So if I invest in Bitcoin, because I think it's not going to be correlated with inflation, so it's going to be a great hedge against inflation, and inflation starts to rise and Bitcoin goes down as inflation rises in some sort of persistent pattern, then I need to sell and I need to write that down before I ever buy it. And then commit to do that, right? If um, I'm climbing a mountain, I need to set a turnaround time. If I'm buying a stock, I need to have a stop loss. You know, if I'm unhappy in my work, I need to say, how long am I okay with the situation as is? Let's say I say three months. 
And then I say, well, what are the signals in three months that would tell me that things are not worth me continuing? So all I'm doing is I'm not allowing it to be like in three months I go, oh, I'm still unhappy. In three months I go, oh, I'm still unhappy. And I haven't actually set out a plan. I'm just trying to set out a plan in advance. What are things that could be occurring? Like my boss hasn't changed their behavior. I'm not getting uh, good reviews. I'm not enjoying the work. I'm dreading going in, whatever. I don't know what that, you know, whatever the list would be. Write them down and say, I'm going to revisit this in three months. And if this is the situation in the world, then I need to start looking for another job. And say to yourself, okay, what do I need to do in the next three months to make things better? And if I do all those things and I see all these signals that things are still crappy, I have to walk away. But you have to do it in advance before the bomb art, you know, before you're already at ground zero. You got to do it way before then. So like on my notes that I had written down to talk to you about, kill criteria was at the top of my list because that I thought was just genius. Oh. No, it is. It could get you out of so much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> if you you're know, willing so to do it. So I actually, so I do this with um, executives that I coach a lot. So I would say the biggest killer for executives is an, an just an absolute unwillingness to let people go. So and what I think is really interesting is that this is where we sort of get into sort of a focus on the things we started. They're they're often coaching them. They're often responsible for hiring them. So if they let them go, what does that mean about my hiring abilities? Does that mean I'm a bad coach, right? Like, am I a bad picker? Like, we we can now see all of that stuff kind of get, you know, oh, I put so much time into them. I don't want to have wasted my time. All the things that kind of make it very hard for us to walk away. And they get really hyper-focused on feeling like they can turn that person around. And the problem is, again, when we think about opportunity costs, if you have an underperformer on a team, you're being very unfair to the other people on the team because someone's carrying that load. Someone's having to deal with the fact that there's someone who's not performing, who's taking a seat. So that's kind of number one is I try to remind people it's not fair to the other people on the team. And then the other thing is that they do that thing, which is what if I hire someone new and they don't work out? And I'm like, okay, but they might work out. And the person that you have in the seat isn't working out despite all your coaching. Okay, so regardless, I can say all that stuff still in blue in the face. It's still very hard for people to let people go. The other thing I would say is that if someone's not performing in their job, they're probably unhappy. And if you let them go, it gives them an opportunity to go find a better job. So it's actually unkind to the person that you're trying to be nice to. So it's like, it's bad kind of all around, but we get really sort of like my, myopic about it. Right. And we're like, no, I need to, I need to, you know, and it's all like, I'm, I've got it. I know I can do it. I know I can turn them around. I feel really bad. I don't want to let them go. I, I don't want to feel like I'm mean, whatever. Okay. So I use this kill criteria tactic with them all the time. So I'll just say, Tim, like you got this person in the role. They're not working out. How long are you okay with that? You know, and they'll be, you know, they'll say a quarter. Okay. So you're good with that for a quarter. So what are the things that you want to see from this employee that would tell you that they've turned it around? All right. So the, this is benchmarks, right? Like we're just benchmarking. What are the things that you would see that would tell you that things are going better? We make a list of those things. Then I say, what are the things that you would be seeing that would tell you that things are not where they need to be and that you should let them go? And so we make a list of those things. So those are the kill criteria. Then I say, so tell me the in what the inputs are into creating that good world. Okay, so that might be, well, I could do some extra one-on-one -on -one time. I could pair them with somebody else. You know, I could be very clear about what my expectations are. And whatever, we figure out what those things are. And then, and then I'll say, Tim, go sit down with the employee and, and say, we both know that you're not performing. I think we can agree to that. Uh, let me tell you what's going on with me. Um, and I think let's really give it a three month go here. And then I would say to the, I would say, Tim, ask the employee what they think good looks like. What are, what are the things that they would expect to change, see change in the next three months? What are the outputs? What are the behaviors that they would expect in the next three months that would make them feel like they've really turned it around? 
and have them make that list with you. And then you can coach them into something that looks like your list. And then also set out that, okay, can we agree that if you're not hitting these things, that it's going to be time to part ways? And then tell me what you think you need from me in order to in order to do this, in order to make things go well. So now you've collaborated with the person. You've agreed to what the kill criteria are. You've agreed, this is what good looks like. This is what not good looks like. This is what the inputs are going to be. And now everybody's on the same page. And then you can let them go in three months if they don't hit it. What's interesting is that what often happens in those circumstances is that the employee themselves kind of realizes that they can't get there and they'll exit themselves because you have made it so clear what the expectations are. And then they can see for themselves that they're not really performing. And then sometimes, and I've seen this happen, they really rise to the occasion. And because you've been so clear about what the expectations are, they end up performing a lot better and they can they sometimes will turn into a superstar. That is awesome. I feel like I just got some executive level training right there. <laughs> that is very awesome. Um, so the book is quit. Everybody should read it. Uh, and again, it's 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 not just about being successful in business. It's I think it's a, applicable to all areas of life. Um, just super, super great job. You got one more question for you. Okay. Well, maybe two. First and okay. the easy one. If if people want to learn from you or find all your books and where, where's the best place to go? Do you send them to a certain place? Do you want them to? Oh, so you can go to annieduke.com. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, I'm on Twitter a bit. I just started a Substack actually. That's been really fun. Awesome. Uh, the Substack's called Thinking in Bets. Uh, so that's good. Um, and then I... Uh, I have a a nonprofit called the Alliance for Decision Education. I always try to point people there to check that out. We're trying to bring decision education to all K through 12 students. Invaluable. That's awesome. We think so. (laughs) No, I I, I mean, I wish I had that. Well, that's kind of it, right? Like we never got taught any of that stuff when we were young. And I think particularly in today's information ecosystem, uh, really teaching kids how to sort of figure out like what's true and how you might make decisions uh, in this very complex world that we live in to put your Um, best foot forward. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of tripping over it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Hardest question. Well, do you like peanut butter? I love peanut butter. Crunchy or creamy? Oh, that's interesting. Depends on my mood. I like both actually. As do I. Um, do you know what? Do you know what? Actually, I'll tell you what's a really good in between. Okay. So, um, so I I like all peanut butters, but you know how you can go to like uh, Whole Foods or whatever, mm-hmm. and they have the machine and you can yep. grind it. It actually kind of is a very happy medium, because it's not like super creamy, like Skippy, which Skippy wouldn't be my favorite because it's very sugary. But like you know where it's like really, really creamy, right. and it's also not super, super chunky. It's like right in between, and that texture is probably my favorite. That kind of like fresh ground peanut butter texture. It is a great texture, but the uh, the flavors is different too. I like the. It like, is. It's very it, just peanuts. Yes. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. So I t- I don't really like very sweet things. So I love peanut butter, but I like it to be peanut butter. I, and I, I, I like the more salty. I like salt. So, oh, yeah. So my thing isn't like my problem isn't like I'm going to tuck into like seven candy bars. It's don't put chips and salsa in front of me because if you do, give me one basket and get your own damn basket. Yes. So I will eat the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. It's fantastic. But this is this is going to sound crazy. Um, I've never said this before on the podcast but what i like to do is take sometimes i'll take a uh, grinder salt and i'll grind it over the top of the peanut butter jar and like oh, that's and, amazing and eat it like that and then when it's gone i'll do a little bit more <laughs> i would to- by the way i would totally do that you should try it it's, it's, it's I awesome would. if you it ever awesome. catch me eating a sweet by the way it's got salt in it uh, yes absolutely yeah like any way. kind of like really salty chocolate or i was at a oh. so i'm a i'm a vegan and I was at this amazing vegan restaurant in Philly uh, the other day. Um, and uh, 
does I don't eat I don't usually order dessert, but my husband was like, Oh no, you should totally just get this dessert. And it was a cheesecake, a vegan cheesecake. And it had a like a a hard caramel on top of it. And it was so salty. And so I ate it. I'm like, oh my God, this is so delicious. But I can't imagine another human being loving this. But it was like, I was like, it's so salty that it tastes almost like salt, like salt with a little bit of caramel with it. And I was like, I think it's delicious, but I'd be, I'm surprised that anybody else wants to eat this, but this might be my perfect dessert. I, I would eat it. I, there's a, you probably heard of it. There's an electrolyte drink out called LMNT element. Mm-hmm. And it's called their, like their tagline is like, stay salty, but they have a chocolate salt uh, electrolyte drink that I put in co- my coffee. It's amazing. To oh, me. see, there you go. I, I mean, I have such a heavy salt hand. It's when I'm cooking, there's so much salt in my food, but I also, I'm just also just so that people don't like, aren't like, Oh, you're promoting high blood pressure. I have low blood pressure. So the salt is not, a, is not a health problem for me. I am encouraged by doctors to eat lots of salt. Yes. Eat and drink responsibly. Everyone that's listening. <laughs> yes. Please don't. If you have like, if your blood pressure is high, Please don't salt your peanut butter and put salt all over your cheesecake. Part of it's knowing your body. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. But um, we're fellow salt travelers. Then. Yes, ma'am. Annie, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now get outside and play.